Have you ever thought about opening your own mobile card or kiosk business? Maybe the facility you manage could establish new revenue by adding coffee, food, or retail services. Cart King International can be the answer to your needs. Cart King is a North American designer and manufacturer of the finest mobile coffee, food, and retail carts and kiosks. Cart King has been working with clients and corporations across North America for 20 years, providing innovative designs, custom manufacturing, and timely delivery. Carts and kiosks are fun, and so are the dozens of designs on our website. Please visit us today at www.cart-king.com or just call us at 1-877-986-7771 and get your sales rolling. If you find yourself in need of legal representation, it can be a very stressful time in your life. In my career, I have dealt with thousands of lawyers, I have dealt with thousands of law firms, and I can confidently recommend to you Keith M. Davidson at kmdlaw.com. Available 24 hours, seven days a week. Just log into kmdlaw.com. That's kmdlaw.com. Or you can call toll-free 833-4-KMD-LAW. That's 833-4-KMD-LAW. Personal injury, wrongful death, STDs, sexual assault, car accidents. They handle it all efficiently and professionally. It doesn't matter how imposing the opposition may be. Because the team at KMDLaw.com are battle-tested and fierce. They will not stop until justice prevails. Go to KMDLaw.com or call toll-free 833-4KMDLaw. If you're in for the fight of your life, stop screwing around and contact KMDLaw. PureSoapFlakes.com, 218-568-2525. Have you ever heard of Castile Soap? Pure Soap Flake Company handcrafts fine soap bars, laundry powder, and concentrated soap flakes using organic vegetable oils from their northern Minnesota facility. Bathe your body and wash your clothes with pure soap products that are free of fragrance, GMOs, palm oil, sodium lauryl sulfate, and synthetic additives. Keep it clean, folks. Pure Soap Flake Company products are kind to living creatures and sensitive skin, safe for drains and waterways, and work great in high-efficiency washers and top- and front-loading machines. They have a little promotion going on. Contact them to order some soap. Mention the Opperman Report. You're going to get a free gift. They're going to sing a little extra soap, travel size, soap bars, and laundry soap, cleaning soap flakes. I've been using that stuff all day long today. Great stuff. Order today at puresoapflakes.com or give them a call. 218-568-2525. 218-568-2525. Pure Soap Flake Company is a proud member of the Handcrafted Soap and Cosmetic Guild. The Opperman Report is brought to you by Aquadam.net. You can give them a call at 707-764-2119. A flooded home is never easy to deal with. You're left with the mess to clean up, the insurance companies to deal with, and not to mention all the memories, the precious memories that are lost in the flood. You can never replace those. And Aquadam can be a tool in your arsenal to protect your home and property from the floodwaters. The coffer dam is filled with water to control water and is reusable as long as it's taken care of. It can protect your home or business from rising floodwaters like a dam, but without the beavers. It can also be used in construction. If you need an area to be dewatered, an aqua dam can do the job. An aqua dam was used at SeaWorld in Orlando for the Mako roller coaster ride during the coaster's construction by dewatering the work area. An aqua dam is now dewatering the work area at San Antonio SeaWorld for their newest roller coaster ride. An aqua dam has been used in many construction projects all around the U.S. and all around the world. Now give aqua dam a call, 707-764-2119. You can look them up online at aquadam.net. You can find them on Facebook at Aquadam Inc. And you call them up, you email them, you tell them Ed Opperman sent you, and they're going to take 10% off the price. Aquadam.net, 707-764-2119. It's the Opperman Report. Join digital forensic investigator and PI Ed Opperman for an in-depth discussion of conspiracy theories, strategy of new world order resistance, high-profile court cases in the news, and interviews with expert guests and authors on these topics and more. It's the Opperman Report. And now, here is investigator Ed Opperman. Okay, welcome to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, private investigator Ed Opperman. You can find me at Opperman Investigations and Digital Forensic Consulting. Uh, you can email me directly at uh, OppermanInvestigations at gmail.com. If you like our show, be sure and check out our Patreon, Opperman Report Patreon. We got uh, brand new content going up there every month, about eight hours of new content. We just put up a show with uh, Bradley Birkenfeld about the Hunter Biden laptop. We got some exclusive information on that. Um, and also to our archives, you can always find for free at Spreaker.com. 
Twitter.com. Uh, put up new content uh, every night there, uh, repeats, and then a live show on Friday night. Our guest today is Jake Hanrahan, coming to us from the UK. Uh, UK at the moment, but the guy's traveling all over the world. You can find him at jakehanrahan.com, where he has a lot of his popular films. He's a filmmaker and a journalist. A world traveler he hits all the um, war zones out there. Uh, and also, you want to check out his platform, popularfront.co. Mr. Hanrahan, are you there? Yes, yes. Thanks very much for having me on. Yeah, thank you so much. Hey, tell us about yourself. Who is Jake Hanrahan? Um, I'm just me, man. I'm 30 <laughs> years old. I've been a reporter for about seven years now. Um, completely self-taught. I didn't do uni or any of that. Um, used to work for Vice News, that's where I kind of got a name for myself, and you know, now I have my own independent platform, Popular Front. Now, how do you finance all this, and how do you get yourself all around the world into these war zones, the, the passports, the visas, how do you pull that off? Well, before, obviously, when I was at Vice, um, and freelancing for various other companies, it was a hell of a lot easier. Now I'm independent. It's much more difficult, but we have a Patreon like you do, uh, patreon.com slash popular front. And, you know, we've been going three years now and we're in a position where, you know, we can afford to go and do these things off of the subscriptions on the Patreon. You know, we have a bonus content regularly up there. Um, we also sell merchandise, which believe it or not is doing really well. But um, we, we refuse to have any kind of corporate advertising or venture capital because I just feel like all of that is a big problem when it comes to journalism and it kind of you end up with people above you and you know popular front i don't really want anyone above us you know the ones that are doing it we should be the ones that can control the story you know, or tell it as it is now, it seems also too that, that you're constantly in hot zones you know like war zones are you like some kind of a, like an adventure junkie or adrenaline junkie um, no, <laughs> honestly, like the older I get, the less I want to go to the conflict zone. Good. But there, there's, yeah, there is an element to it where it is, it's obviously exciting, but it's, it's not so much the conflict, it's the way that life is just so different in a conflict area, you know, like everything is tipped on its head, you know, what was important to you at home suddenly becomes completely irrelevant, and then you meet all these people who are, you know, just trying to live in the most hardest situations, and that for me is very exciting you know like meeting the most fascinating people being able to tell their story and, and do it all like that so that for me is a part of it and I, I definitely you know when I was younger I was probably a little bit more reckless but mm. now you know I, I do take a lot more precautions and, and these people living in these hot zones like what is their biggest uh, struggle <sighs> man I mean I think honestly one of the biggest struggles is getting attention mm. for the conflicts like a popular front a lot of the time we cover underreported conflicts so for example the war in um, Nagorno-Karabakh between Azerbaijan and Armenia you know it's just flared up it's got really bad we've been covering that since I mean since 2018 since we started so we, we try and report on these things that are less um, noticeable and another thing I think people are struggling is kind of which proxy power now is you know has has their back which one doesn't and that can be a real problem you know if someone starts up like a separatist fight for independence to be honest their biggest problem is not going to be can they win it's going to be you know which proxy power is going to stop them so yeah it's, it's a weird situation these days yeah we forgot to mention your patreon which is popular front on patreon and also to your youtube yeah. channel which is called popular front as well that's uh, right yeah, yeah people should go to all these platforms and subscribe to all the work the guys are doing here now what about do you ever find yourself that you are a target when you're in these war zones yeah, uh, yeah, not in the war zones as such. Um, problem. I did a lot of work into um, neo-Nazi kind of terror groups over the last three years, and a lot of them were like, you know, printing out my picture and putting it in their videos and shooting it, and so they're going to shoot me and kill me and whatever. And uh, the police rang me at one point and were like, "Oh, we have intelligence that they're trying to find your address." So I was like, "Okay, <laughs> like, good luck." And then the other problem is like despotic governments. So, right. you know, when I was reporting on um, the Kurds fighting against the Turkish government in Southeast Turkey, the government arrested me and two of my colleagues. You know, if that is a target, you become a target to the state then. So, you know, that was a problem. Well, if, if you got arrested, how'd you get out? Uh, man, eventually they just deported us after like 11 days. I okay. mean, there was a bit of a, um, 
like international kind of outcry at the time. I mean, I was like 25 and they put into like anti-terror prisons, like the max security prisons you can think of and in Turkey. So like obviously a lot of people are like, what the hell, they haven't done anything. You know, obviously we hadn't. They just wanted to stop us reporting on what was happening. So, you know, eventually I think the pressure got quite big and they were like, right, just kick them out, get them out of here. And we got deported. Yeah. Yeah. Can never go back. I had that guy, Billy Hayes, on my show, who was in Midnight Express, yeah. right? I had him on the show. Now, it was wow. the Turkish prison you were in, was it like his? It wasn't like that. Okay. Like, it was nowhere near as bad. <laughs> <laughs> it really wasn't. But it, it wasn't pleasant, you know. It was certainly, yeah. you know, i got friends in the UK who've been to jail. And I, I think, wow, I wish, I wish the one I was in was that nice, you know. So it certainly wasn't nice. But no, it wasn't Midnight Express. Okay, great. Thank okay. God. I, I, oh, thank God is right, man. <laughs> but, you know, I tell you, you know, all around the world, there are people sitting in prisons just as bad as Midnight Express. They're there right now yep. as we talk, you know, and, and this is something we need to really support, like human rights organizations and stuff, Amnesty International. Yeah. yeah. And the work you're doing is great work, too, man. Now, Thanks, man. Appreciate it. You, the other day, or about a month ago, you were all excited because you just did this big film about printable machine guns, or printable automatic weapons uh, what's the name of that story yeah yeah so that's our latest documentary uh, called plastic defense and yeah like you said it's about 3d printed guns but it's it's not about the ones in america which you know it's fine it's legal it's a hobby there it's about a guy that's making them in western europe and he's trying to export them to countries all over the world where it's obviously it's completely illegal to do that in uh you know in western europe we can barely own a water pistol over here you know <laughs> so it's it's a big deal um a lot of americans don't understand why it's a big deal but it is because over like i said over here we just don't have the gun culture we don't have the laws you know most people go their whole lives without ever seeing a gun so you know a very big deal it's got like five hundred thousand views in like a week so people are interested thank god and, and like even the police the average uh, cop doesn't carry a gun right yeah yeah police don't even carry firearms at all yeah unless it's like um kind of like a higher level of police at like uh train stations and stuff like that like big ones in london um but no no they they're generally the vast majority do not cover do not carry firearms in this country yeah wouldn't that be nice now we have um uh, the plastic defense how did you make contact with this guy well it, it was a long process it took me about three years in total i took notice of the 3d printed guns when they first came out um, with Cody Wilson and um, Defense Distributed. Did a little article on that and I had him on my podcast and obviously things went south for him. And then I noticed that this kind of, this new decentralized group, the Terence Dispense was there, you know, and that's kind of like a, a joke on Defense Distributed, you know, the name, the Terence Dispense, this is the new group. And they, they are decentralized and, you know, if one of them goes down, it doesn't matter. They all, you know, all of their data is out there for everybody. And I don't know, they were a lot more bombastic. They were a lot more kind of, I don't want to say trendy, but, but they definitely understood like modern day kind of aesthetics and they were trying to make it cool, you know, and that for me was a very interesting element to it culturally. So I just started contacting them and speaking to them. I wrote an article for Wired, you know, obviously they, they don't really trust journalists, but I, I kind of said like, look, here's my other work. You know, I'm not like this kind of, screaming opinion journalist I, I do real work like have a look and eventually after these years and years i just you know i got the access and jay stark said like right let's go let's do it quickly <laughs> so i did it and then you know and that was the result now, now what motivates him to want to get this kind of publicity um i think he he's so adamant in his beliefs that he wants them to spread and you know whilst i told him straight up like this is not going to be an advert for you like you know this is a bit of journalism i'm not doing propaganda for you he you know he was very respectful of that he's like yeah, yeah that's fine but he just wanted to get his message out there so you know i wanted to tell the story i think people should know about this and he wanted people to know about it so in a way it kind of went hand in hand you know for better or worse now, now you say western europe did you ever reveal like what country he's in no 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 no, no, no. okay definitely not all my hard drives are mince me <laughs> just in case the police come knocking gotcha gotcha now he seems I, I watched the film it's excellent you know and but the guy's very the guy's very intense what's it like when very. you're not filming with him you know and you're just trying to sit around and have a sandwich with this guy <laughs> honestly we, we barely saw him unless we were filming like okay. he was very turn up at this point okay now you have to leave like he was extremely 
like um, careful with his security and where he is. And you know, like, I think he. The, I mean, the last three years I've been speaking to him, he's been in a different country every single time. You know, mm. so this guy moves around a lot. I would love to know what he actually does. I don't know, but yeah, we we didn't have a lot of talk outside of the uh, the documentary, to be honest. Unfortunately, I would have liked to, but I understand he's got to be safe. Yeah, he's just super intense guy. Now, how, now, how does he fund all this? Do you know? Uh, it's through Patreon. Yeah, it's through Patreon. So, in the last year, our subscriptions have really gone through the roof because we've we just you know we've been working very hard at it. We always make sure there are at the very least two bonus episodes a month. Um, there's access to this big kind of community and resource research Discord that we have, that, mm-hmm. which you know for up and coming reporters. I think they really like it. Um, you know, we've got narrated articles. We've got all sorts of stuff on there. So I think it's definitely value for money, you know. And I think people recognize the, the ethos we have. You know, we, we've turned down big sponsorship mm. because we don't want to destroy the kind of integrity that we've built. So I think people then respect that. And yeah, man, the, the Patreon just it did well. And, and also the merchandise sales. And I just saved all the money and was like, right, you know, let's go and do this now. And now Jay, Jay Stark, though, you mentioned that he was traveling different countries all the time. How is he mm. funding his operation? What is he? I would love to know. <laughs> I would <laughs> love to know. I don't know how they, honestly, like, I don't know about the Terrence Dispense. I don't know if they, I think they have, like, Bitcoin. People can donate Bitcoin and stuff like that. But I'm not really sure. You know, I don't know. A lot of them just have normal jobs and stuff. But what he does, I don't know. To be fair, though, like in Europe, it's it's not that expensive to travel around to okay. you know different countries, especially if you're in Eastern Europe or something. That's very cheap. Now, um, uh, oh yeah, what would the penalties be if they were to catch him for producing these weapons? What would the penalties be for? Um, I think an absolute minimum straight away would probably be about ten years in prison okay. for him. To be honest, because you know he's not only creating the firearms, he's creating his own ammunition. And he's spreading the, the work, right? He's telling everybody, I want you to do this. You know, he's trying to make other people do it or get other people to do it. So I, I think he would be in serious trouble. On the worst side of it, they might try and charge him with terrorism or something. And in that case, man, he would probably be looking at, you know, 20 years or something. Maybe. Now, now what about the other folks involved in his group that are also, have any of them ever been caught? Well, in America, the thing is, it's funny, like in America, it's completely legal. So it's just a hobby for them. So the vast majority of the work happened in America. However, Jay Stark in Europe founded the group. So it's like he comes up with certain things and then they will test it for him. Or, you know, and it's not just him, obviously, all of them are building all these stuff. But there are other people in Europe that I know for definite have built these these weapons, um, specifically the FGC-9, which is the one we see in the uh, documentary. So I know that there's other people. There was a guy in the UK last year. He got about four or five years because he got caught um, 3D printing a, a pistol. And he also had ammunition. He, he said he found the ammunition in the park. <laughs> so obviously he bought some of that. But yeah, so he got about three or four years, I think. That's a good so question. Right? I, I've done some reloading ammunition when I was a kid. Yeah. You know? Now. Yeah. So I, I can understand, okay, you melt the lead, you know, you, you can pour it in there. But what about the primer and the shell case? And you can't manufacture that. That you have to pick up, uh, you have to purchase that, no? Right, right. So they can, you can order in those things into Europe, right? Well, you can. So you can also order in, like, the barrel for the gun because the barrel is not a barrel. It's, it's, a, it's a metal tube that they use for um, pressure, like uh, pressure machines in China. So then they send the tube and then they have uh, instructions on how to then turn that tube into a working rifle. Um, and then they, you know, they order in the, the shell casings and then they okay. maybe, I, I don't know about the actual bullet part, but that's, you know, maybe a little illegal, <laughs> little illegal ordering. No, the actual bullet part, you can, uh, the shell casing, if you can get, get a hold of that, that's fine. The bullet part, you actually, you melt, you melt the, the lead and you pour it in there. There's a, a, a mold right, right. And, then, and then you press I, it in. Yeah. yeah. Now, um, uh, the gunpowder is the issue as well, but right. they found sneaky ways to do that as well. Yeah, that was my next question. How do they get the gunpowder too? Now, did you fire yeah, this weapon? So, yeah, go ahead. No, 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 no. I wanted to, trust me, but... It was just kind of against my own ethics to do so. You know, I just felt like I'm here to work, not play around. And knowing my luck, the thing would have backfired and killed me or something. You know what I mean? But um, no, I didn't fire it. But the um, the, the gunpowder, they either kind of smuggle it across the borders. Um, you know, it's not that hard to find people in Europe to do things like that. Or there's, I can't remember what it is, but there's some kind of 
home improvement um, thing that you can get, which if you take it apart, like a hundred of them, you'll have enough gunpowder for like five bullets or something. You know, it's like it's in something else which they've worked out to take it apart. But again, they have instructions all online. They're telling everybody how to do it. You know, anyone can download it. And if they're motivated, people, you know, people will do it. Fascinating, fascinating topic. Okay, have you been in touch with him since the, the show aired? With Jay Stark? No, no, no. I, I said to him, like, as soon as we leave, everything needs to be wiped just for, just for you know, safety purposes. I mean, whether I agree with him or not is irrelevant. He's a source, and, you know, it's my job to protect him, right? So, you know, I had all our cards, all our hard drives. You know, as soon as the thing was done, we wiped everything and basically, like, ground them down because I heard that it's not enough just to wipe them. You know, you have to actually destroy them. So, unfortunately... That's down the bin. <laughs> he has money down the bin, but, you know, it's worth it, I think. But do you think he's happy with the final production? I don't know, you know. Like, I, I'm not sure. Like, I think he will be, but I'm going to probably ask someone at the parents' dispense, but they don't hear they don't hear from him too often. You know, I don't think he's there as often as, you know, the others are. Um, but I do need to ask them. But I think he probably is. I think he probably would want more technical detail in there. Hmm. You know, we had some conversations, and I said, like, look, this cannot be an instruction manual. <laughs> this is a documentary. Um, firstly, it would get me kicked off of YouTube if there was too much instructions in there. Um, you know, and we're already nearly been kicked off like a hundred times. Our whole channel is demonetized. Um, and secondly, it's just, you know, it, I think that would not be a good look for a journalist to be like, yeah, let me teach you how to do this. It had to be a, a fine balance, you know? Yeah, I just got uh, another flag on YouTube myself, and we can't upload. Really? Shows that air on AMFM radio <laughs> okay, are not allowed on YouTube. <laughs> I, can't, I don't like that. That's America for you, man, in 2020. Uh, it's just it's getting so bad in Europe as well, man. Like the, I mean, there's one thing that Jay Stark mentions in the documentary, which is very true. And he says that authoritarianism in Europe is increasing, and it really is. Yeah. And it's not like jackboots on the floor. It's It's tiny bits of hard to understand legalese that go into new bills that most people don't understand but when you look at it and you take notice of it it's getting ridiculous you know it's actually not good yeah i know even you know you're, you're pretty much still a young man i'm 58 years old the world's changed uh, and not for the better for I the average mind. person yeah, yeah. now uh, that's plastic defense check that out it's on the popular uh, front youtube channel the popular front dot co uh, is the website check it out excellent work man i'm very very impressed now there's Thank another you. story about the unabomber what is your story about the unabomber <laughs> yeah yeah sorry <laughs> um i mean it's a little bit of a kind of a joke like people say like oh god jake loves the unabomber it's not like i love the unabomber but I, I think at the time when like it was popular like kind of you know, kaczynski's work became popular again a few years ago with you know, there's a, there was a series came out on Netflix, and right. there was also kind of online, you know, Kaczynskiites that were really, you know, kind of bringing back his uh, his ideology. You know, and I think it was the only reporter that I read his manifesto, and I was like, well, yeah, he's got, you know, I'm not saying he's a good guy or I like him, but he makes a lot of excellent points, I think, you know, and especially when you look at modern day, it's like, well, yeah, he kind of predicted a lot of this. So then I got the trust of, like, these kind of online Kaczynski fans, and I wrote this article about them, for Wired um, and yeah it was, you know it was, it was interesting um, a lot of them hated the article but that's fine <laughs> you know like, that's fine and they kind of I kind of said like this is probably going to be a passing phase and they were like no it isn't and like lo and behold it was you know like it's, it's not nowhere near as big as it was but for a while they were calling themselves Pine Tree Gang you know like they'd even formed that so for a little while it was quite a big thing on the internet and, and what, what are they the advocating parts. what are these guys advocating so neo luddites. So they're they're like neo luddites. So they're kind of advocating the the kind of rise of um, technology and the you know the industrial society was uh, the industrial revolution was a mistake and that it's you know it's caused us a lot of pain and you know the the, the kind of proliferation of social media and all of that is is a mistake and it's bad for our brains and it's bad for our human psyche. And I think they're probably right in that sense. But ironically, a lot of them. Well, they just post online. Like a lot of them didn't actually go and do anything outside of that, so they kind of defeated the the purpose of what they were trying to teach people. But there was quite a few of them that you know they lived it as well. They would go and spend weeks in the forest and you know connect with nature. Um, I don't think that's ever a bad thing. But obviously, the other side of it is that they advocate for the violent destruction of you know industrial society. So that's where it can get a little bit tricky. 
Are they actively uh, taking steps and plant, you know, planting bombs, doing all that kind of stuff too? Mm, not really, but there okay. was there was a group. So it was called ITS. Um, I've completely forgotten what the uh, Spanish version of that is, but essentially the English version of their name is um, tending towards savagery. So basically, they're like this weird kind of eco-terrorist post-ideological nihilist like the weirdest ideology you can think of and it's kind of like destruction for destruction's sake you know um they want to go back to caveman vibes almost and wow. honestly they did it yeah they did a few attacks like in mexico is where they started but then over the last few years all of the attacks that they've claimed have actually been lies like it's been someone else but in the start they they blew up like a uh a nano machines um, scientist or something like that. No, nano machines. I don't know. Nano science, something like that. Um, so they did a few things, but you know, now they're kind of dormant. You know, I think nowadays they got a group for everybody. You know, people that want to go back to caveman times. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. They can find friends on the internet and start a group. Well, how about these incels right. and these men going their own way? But what, what, at, at twenty years ago, you would imagine this. <laughs> Right. I mean, five years ago, ten years ago, I wouldn't have imagined. It's true too. Yeah. It's weird. It, I think a part of it is like culturally, people have been allowed to like not be told to just shut up. Like I do yeah. think sometimes you need to tell people like just shut up. Like everything you have to say <laughs> is not always important, you know. But unfortunately, now people think everything they have to say they they feel they have a right to like, you know. I mean, everyone has a right to say what they want, but these people are not just asking to speak. They want to like cause destruction right you know like some of the uh not all of them but like a, a small percentage of the incel movement are like extremely violent oh, yeah. know, they want to kill women and it's just like what where is this you know like this pure anger is just it's just i don't know they kind of feed off of each other i think you know well, it it's, it's, all, it's incredibly sad as well you know i had him on the show i had the incels on the show yeah. a nice guy wow. you know? nice guy yeah. which one Oh, I forget his name oh, right God. now. He was one of the more vocal ones who's been around. Yeah, you know, yeah. You know. Then he said he yeah. was an incel, and he was again. Uh, you know. But a nice guy. Uh, you know? Now, what yeah. about uh, <laughs> what about uh, inside the Capitol Hill Autos Autonomous Zone? You, you embedded yourself oh. in there. What did you find there? Yeah, no, I, I wasn't there, actually. It was uh, like a team of mine did it over there in America for me. Like, I can't go to America because of all my, you know, stupid charges in turkey so it's a very difficult for me to come over at the moment um but you know i wasn't interested in it at first you know i was like oh this looks like a like a powwow it looks like nonsense but then when you know these two lads um john laflair and uh uh max curtis they said like look we're there we're staying here we're filming we're going to show you what we got I said, okay fine and then when i looked at it i realized like oh actually this is way more interesting than I'd seen any of the media present. You know, like right-wing media had just been like, oh, look at all these stupid communists or whatever. And then the left-wing media were just like, you know, oh, they're criminals or they're, they're whatever. You know what I mean? It was just like boring, stupid new stuff. So they spent like a good good amount of time there. And what they filmed was quite interesting. Um, our documentary is less about the politics of the place and more about the kind of there was a lot of armed groups there um and then there's also the element of like you know black people there that are from there saying like yeah we appreciate it but you need to let us speak a little bit more it's all well and good with a load of like you know white socialists or anarchists turned up but it's like some of them i think lost track of what they were trying to bring attention to um which you know it's interesting i think it brings some some attention to it now did you your your team did they find that this was an organic movement or did they think it was uh, control from the outside? Um, it was definitely organic, but it was also the problem. It became controlled from the inside, actually. Hmm. You know, like the problem was you would get like this group or that group would then turn up and they would like they'd be like, oh, no, we we have this part of the, the area now. We, we run this part. You can't come in here. And it's like, well, aren't you doing exactly what you said you were against? You know, like. The irony of like anarchists turning up somewhere and you know and i'm very interested in anarchism i'm nothing against anarchists but like a lot of them i think were very confused you know and they would turn up somewhere and start acting like the cops and then they're saying like you know abolish the cops it's like well i think a lot of them understood or got taught a lesson that you do have to police a situation that doesn't mean you have to have the thin blue line and what we have is policing now but i think they realize like you have you know for, for people to be safe and free you do need some policing, you know what I mean? So that very quickly devolved into 
I mean, there was gangs getting involved, and there was, I think, three people got killed. Like, it just became a terrible mess. Um, and honestly, like, I think that was the fault of a lot of the, like, kind of white political ideologues there were too scared to speak up and tell her, mm. hey, we have to actually organize something. Um, you know, so, and then because of that, you know, they kind of didn't protect the people they, they were meant to be protecting, unfortunately. Mm. But I don't know, man. It was a very weird situation. And I just think that everyone just, a lot of egos, you know, got fed there, unfortunately. That's so true. Any political movement, you got that. Everybody wants to hear um, themselves talk, man. They want to make a speech. Exactly. <laughs> you know? It's now, tiring, man. It's tiring. Now, you've been all over. And you talk about police brutality. Where have you seen the most oppressive police? Oh, that's a great question. Um, for me, I think I've seen the most oppressive police in Turkey. Yeah, Turkey by far. <laughs> you know, like you. Way, yeah, <laughs> you're wearing yeah, the, the, you're the prison. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> but it's, you know, even before that, like we, we were filming at one point, and there was like a young girl who'd been she she was 13, I remember, and she had like a shrapnel wound in her back. No, sorry, I think a bullet lodged in her back and like a shrapnel wound in her head, and she couldn't go to the hospital because the police had parked like anti-personnel carriers outside the hospital and even children when they went to be like we need to be treated they were just arresting for terrorism and it's like what do you mean like you know i think the youngest person to get killed was a baby and the baby was shot with a sniper oh my so God. you know yeah it's, it's like hmm, i don't think that was an accident you know so honestly the stuff i witnessed down there was unbelievably brutal um and then after that like in terms of the context of where it is in the world france like the french police are just awful man like really awful like you know, like I covered the, the Yellow Vest protests, which were an amazingly interesting situation. And we went there and we were like, hey, we've got press pass. We need to go here. And they're like, no, you can't. And I was like, this is Europe. Like, you can't, like, you know what I mean? We're not living in a totalitarian society. We can walk down the road if we want. This wasn't like a police cordon. They would just, like, push you over and be like, no, get out of here. It's like, it's completely illegal, like, to do that for them, you know? And it's, you know, and people say, oh, why are you shocked? And it's like, well, because, you know, we fought tyranny twice you know we won world wars and like we should be living in some kind of better place where that doesn't happen you know so i think it's i think it's really out of order but uh yeah turkey and france i, I think that's when i first found you during the yellow vest uh, movement now yeah w w were you when you saw that were you encouraged did you think it would be successful well this is the thing i don't know what what people a lot of people uh, you know quantify the success of a movement like that in did they win and it's like for me i'm saying it, it doesn't really matter i don't think if they won or not the fact that someone fights to say hey we're not having this i think is always important you know because it, you never know in 10 years what they did then might inspire the group that does win right, right. you can't just you know you, I think you have to have a culture of resistance which i really respect the french for that you know right now there are huge clashes because macron is trying to give some insane authoritarian legal powers to the police where it will become will become illegal for people to film the police whilst on duty and you know that's crazy you can't have that in a democratic society um and it's punishable by like a custodial prison sentence or a, or a four hundred thousand euro fine like or is it forty thousand i think sorry and it, it's just crazy you know like, they can't do that so people are rightly so in my opinion out in the streets now and it's it's not just it's not any political group you know and that's like the yellow vests it wasn't you know, the, the yellow vest wasn't left or right or centrist or whatever. It was just, it was the people. There was, every group was in it, you know. Yeah. We, we ended up seeing anti-fascists fighting fascist members of the yellow vest. You know, there's footage of them both fighting each other in the vest protest. And to me, it was one of the purest forms of like a popular uprising in Europe for a long time. You know? And it was really fascinating. Mm -hmm. Now, what, don't, how could your own personal political views not uh, affect your reporting? Um, I think they do. You yeah. know, I think they do. And I, I think that any journalist that pretends that they don't are just being a little bit dishonest. I think the problem he, I'm, I'm not a problem that I have, but a, a thing that I recognize is like, yeah, I do have certain biases. And almost when you understand that and accept it, it actually becomes more useful. Because then I have to say, like, hang on. Am I being fair here? I know I've got this bias. Let me catch myself and check my bias. You know, as long as you're willing to critique yourself and accept critique, I think that's okay. Hmm. Um, I think, you know, it makes you a better journalist, actually. I've said this before. I think total objectivity is kind of psychopathy, you know, because that would mean you don't 
you're not swayed or you don't feel, you know, and it's, trust me, when you're covering war, if you don't feel certain things when you're covering that, you're, you're no good out there. You know, you have to be a well-rounded human being mm-hmm. and feel empathy for the people. So, you know, I think you just got to check yourself and, you know, be fair. Now, how about yourself? How about PTSD? Yeah, and that, I had a bit of that after prison, yeah. actually. Like, that was a big right. deal. Um, it was weird. Like, I didn't think. I thought, I thought oh, I'm fine. And then, like, you know, I'd hear my door, like the postman would deliver something. And I'd, jump, I'd wake up and jump out my skin because obviously the way we were woken up in the morning was the prison guard, right? They'd open the door and shower you and get you up. So I think just hearing that noise of like a door moving just, you know, fricked me for like ages. I was really frightened of it. I was like, ooh, what, the, what is that? Um, but eventually it's fine now. You know, like I, wouldn't, I couldn't watch movies about prisons before as well. Yeah. I was just like, oh, turn this off, turn this off. Like it's just a bad feeling. But... Now, I, you know, I'm fine now. It's easy. It's no problem now. But uh, it was definitely there. This might be a good time to take our commercial break. We are with Jake sure. Hanrahan. You can find him at jakehanrahan.com. Uh, his platform is called popularfront.co. They have a Patreon, Popular Front. And uh, YouTube channel is also Popular Front. Uh, so keep an eye out for this guy's work. It's really, really good stuff. We'll be right back with more of Jake Hanrahan after these messages. And now a word from our sponsors. If you find yourself in need of legal representation, it can be a very stressful time in your life. In my career, I have dealt with thousands of lawyers, I've dealt with thousands of law firms, and I can confidently recommend to you Keith M. Davidson at kmdlaw.com. Available 24 hours, seven days a week, just log into kmdlaw.com, that's kmdlaw.com, or you can call toll-free 833-4-KMD-LAW, that's 833-4-KMD-LAW. Personal injury, wrongful death, STDs, sexual assault, car accidents, they handle it all efficiently and professionally. It doesn't matter how imposing the opposition may be, because the team at KMDLaw.com are battle-tested and fierce. They will not stop until justice prevails. Go to KMDLaw.com or call toll-free 833-4KMDLaw. If you're in for the fight of your life, stop screwing around and contact KMDLaw. Are you ready to change your life? But don't know how to start? Is your stress and worries keeping you awake at night? Have you been battling grief, anxiety, or depression all alone? Have you lost touch with your own sense of being or spirituality? Soul Free Therapies offers professional and affordable live video streaming counseling and coaching services from the comfort of your own home. Sessions offered in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. Go to our website at www.soul-free.com and book your first session today. The Opperman Report is brought to you by Aquadam.net. You can give them a call at 707-764-2119. A flooded home is never easy to deal with. You're left with the mess to clean up, the insurance companies to deal with, and not to mention all the memories, the precious memories that are lost in the flood. You can never replace those. And Aquadam can be a tool in your arsenal to protect your home and property from the floodwaters. The coffer dam is filled with water to control water and is reusable as long as it's taken care of. It can protect your home or business from rising floodwaters like a dam, but without the beavers. It can also be used in construction. If you need an area to be dewatered, an aqua dam can do the job. An aqua dam was used at SeaWorld in Orlando for the Mako roller coaster ride during the coaster's construction by dewatering the work area. An aqua dam is now dewatering the work area at San Antonio SeaWorld for their newest roller coaster ride. An aqua dam has been used in many construction projects all around the U.S. and all around the world. Now give aqua dam a call, 707-764-2119. You can look them up online at aquadam.net. You can find them on Facebook at Aquadam Inc. And you call them up, you email them, you tell them Ed Opperman sent you, and they're going to take 10% off the price. Aquadam.net, 707-764-2119. PureSoapFlakes.com, 218-568-2525. Have you ever heard of Castile Soap? Pure Soap Flake Company handcrafts fine soap bars, laundry powder, and concentrated soap flakes using organic vegetable oils from their northern Minnesota facility. Bathe your body and wash your clothes with Pure Soap products that are free of fragrance, GMOs, palm oil, sodium lauryl sulfate, and synthetic additives. Keep it clean, folks. Pure Soap Flake Company products are kind to living creatures and sensitive skin, safe for drains and waterways, and work great in high-efficiency washers and top- and front-loading machines. 
They have a little promotion going on. Contact them to order some soap. Mention the Opera Room Report. You're going to get a free gift. They're going to sing a little extra soap, travel size, soap bars, and laundry soap, cleaning soap flakes. I've been using that stuff all day long today. Great stuff. Order today at puresoapflakes.com or give them a call. 218-568-2525. 218-568-2525. Pure Soap Flake Company is a proud member of the Handcrafted Soap and Cosmetic Guild. It's the Opera Report. And now, here is Investigator Ed Opperman. Okay, welcome back to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, Private Investigator Ed Opperman. Uh, we're here today with Jake Hanrahan, who's like a, a war correspondent, like the old days, you know, Dan, but, but he's like a do-it-yourself kind of guy doing this. Uh, check out popularfront.co. His Patreon is called Popular Front. And also, too, um, jakehanrahan.com. And also, the YouTube channel is uh, Popular Front. Okay, Jake, um, real quick, too, we were talking about police around the world. Where did you find the, the best policing? Did you, did you spot? <laughs> um, I guess the best ones are the ones that I haven't come in contact with. They just leave you alone, you know. Yeah. Like, um, but sadly, in, in Scandinavian countries, they're kind of chilled out, you know, from what I've noticed. They kind of leave you alone. They're not, like, as on your back. Um yeah, like, they're not bothered about the kind of... I mean, in England, like, our police will... They'll write you a ticket for anything. They're desperate, you know. They'd love to stop people for all sorts. Um, so the police stopped me in my car a while ago, and he said, oh, your back light is out. And it was just dirt on the light in the end, we, we discovered. And I was like, it's just dirt. Like, you can't stop me for that. He's like, go and get your car washed. I was like, really? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, they're... they're you know, we call them, like, uh, bully boys sometimes because, you know, some of them do good stuff. Like, sure, like, the ones that are, like, you know investigating pedophiles and stuff like yeah. that but generally you know they don't do a lot apart from just bother people you know like it's a real it's a real pain actually you know and they're kind of known for it really it's not just me you know i'm not like a cab or anything it's i just have had bad experiences with them and i don't feel like they serve the community like they're meant to be you know yeah, yeah we do need police you know like there's old people who yeah, get scanned yeah, they get I conned agree. out of their money you know that's Absolutely. Kind of, <laughs> kind of, you know we yeah, need yeah, cabs no, yeah. without no. Now, uh, you spent a lot of time in the Mideast, uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Yeah, yeah, I covered, uh, I was in Jerusalem in, I think, 2018, 2017, I think, actually. Um, that was the last time it really kicked off in Al-Aqsa, um, or Temple Mount, as the, the uh, Israelis call it. So, yeah, man, there was a lot, of, um, a lot of clashes around there. Several people got killed. It was chaos. It was really wild, actually. But uh, a very interesting place. I really like East Jerusalem. And and what was the the conflicts like? Police, well, military. Yeah, at the time it wasn't like military. It was well, some of the border guards, the Israeli border guards, were indiscriminately just you know absolutely pumping the crowd full of um, you know these huge tear gas rounds and rubber bullets and stuff like that. So you know there was very little. Um, I mean, they just didn't care who they hit, you know. But at the same time, it was there was a lot of children in the crowd. And it was like, ah, don't bring your kids to this. Like, it was, everybody knew it was going to get violent, like, without a doubt. So it was it was just a very horrible situation, you know. It was, it was brutal, man. Like, I don't know. The, 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 the whole, um, I think Nietzsche said it. Like, Nietzsche said, like, Jerusalem should just, the only way for it to be peaceful would be to um, flatten it. <laughs> you know, which sounds mm -hmm. disgusting. I would never want that to happen. But my point is, it's just, it's just too long. That conflict is too long in the tooth, I think, to ever be fixed, you know? And, and now when you're over there, like, you get press credentials, or, and do they supervise you? Do they follow you around? No, the, the, actually, the Israelis are, were incredibly open, you know? They were like, you know, they, I got the credentials, and they were like, okay, off you go. And like, they didn't bother me at all. Um, and certainly, you know, we spent a lot of time filming in the Palestinian area in East Jerusalem, you know, and we spent a lot of time with Palestinians. Didn't really get any bother, um, to be honest, you know, like lo that's one of the places in the Middle East where I haven't, but certainly I'm sure you would, you know, like I know, I know journalists, that, you know, Israeli journalists that if they kind of, if they're pro-Palestine, oh God, like their life is, can become a living hell, you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. Now, what about, are you able to visit those where the settlers are? You know, I heard that that's really intense. No, I didn't go there, but I have a very good friend of mine, Oren Rosenfeld, and he, um, he, he's like a great producer over there. He has a, a company called Holy Land Productions. I mean, he's, a, he's Israeli, but he has his own beliefs, you know. He's very kind of, he's, he's, he's for no sides, if you know what I mean. He's good night all sides for him. And he made a, a whole film, I think he spent like a year 
hanging around uh, the settlers, especially with a group called the Price Taggers. And those guys are like brutal, man. Like, you know, for anything that happens, they, they will just go into Palestinian areas and just smash it to pieces. And it's like you're literally living in the areas where, you, you know, in the settled areas. You, you could go and live anywhere else in Israel, yet they choose to live there and they still attack the Palestinians. It's, it's just madness, you know. Yeah, it really is. Now, on, on Popular Front, one of the articles, I know it was written by you, but by your team over there, the Boogaloo Cop yeah. Killers, what's the story with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you know the, the Boogaloo movement, the kind of, I think they're mostly, it's, very, it's not really a cohesive movement, but it's mm-hmm. like a decentralized um, ideology, I guess, the you know, anti-government, kind of right libertarian um, ideology, anti, very vehemently anti-cop. Um, and two of the, you know, self-proclaimed proclaimed Oogaloo boys, um, they actually killed two uh, law enforcement officers. So they went on like a kind of a, you know, like a little vigilante mission and they just shot up one of the guard posts and killed a police officer, killed another one. Um, yeah, man, and there was not a lot of information out there on it. And one of our guys, like uh, Ali Winston, great writer, investigative journalist, he looked into it and... You know, it was what it was. And then we did this article. Um, a lot of the boogaloos saw it and went crazy. Like, no, no, this isn't right. And it's like, well, it is. <laughs> it, it is. It's not what you want it to be, but it is correct. You know what I mean? So, but um, I don't know. I think the boogaloo are quite interesting. Like, some of them have, like, I think the liberal media has unfortunately labeled them all as, like, right wing, like, far right fascists or whatever. And it's like, they're, they're definitely not that. Like, there is an element of them that are. But because it is a, it's not a cohesive movement, it's more of an ideology, that doesn't mean that the other groups have let them in. It's just those groups have taken on that form. You know what I'm saying? It's yeah. not like they're responsible for it. So, I don't know. I'm very interested in, like, decentralized ideologies and movements. And we saw a lot of them when the, the clashes were happening in the U.S. But I think the FBI and the CIA have very, very got a big, very close eye on them now at the, uh, the shootings. <laughs> Yeah, they were actually on their way to shoot some friends of mine in Las Vegas protesting. A, no a, way. Yeah, yeah, George Floyd, yeah. Jeez. <laughs> really? Yeah. Were they, the, the, they must have been the, the far right ones, I guess, the fascist kind of ones. Yeah, I believe I they, had I read a, about yeah, this. they had a whole plan yeah. to kidnap judges and stuff. And, you know, whole right, plan. right. Yeah. Now, yeah. Um, some of them are lunatics. Yeah, <laughs> they got them in every year, <laughs> all over the place. Yeah. Now, um, what's the story about now? Where you somehow hooked up with a guy who was a, a dark web drug dealer? Yeah, that was another one. It took me years to get the access to that. It was one of the last pieces I did for Vice. I really loved that article. Um, yeah, man. I, I basically one of these big. It was before all the real big shutdowns came. You know, like Silk Road was big. Um, there was all these other big kind of deep web drug dealing websites. And one of the biggest sellers, I was just contacting him. And I noticed, I wanted to contact him because I noticed he was doing these kind of two-for-one deals. He was doing like holiday specials, you know, on drugs and heroin and stuff. And this was before, like, all the other groups were doing it. So I found him really interesting. And he had a whole team, and I got speaking to him. And over the years, I learned, I kind of got his trust. I proved, you know, I said to him, I proved that, you know, whatever you want, like, wherever I met him, I would meet him. I'd give him my phone. I'd let him take the... You know, put it in a barrier bag so there was no signal or anything. Whatever you wanted, I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm down, let's do it. So we did that, and eventually he was like, okay, you know, you can come and you can come with me, and we, you can stay with me for a weekend, and you can write an article. So we started off in um, Spain, and then we got a, uh, what did we do? Did we get a plane? No, we got a ferry, and then we went to, like, uh, Morocco. Um, we went into the mountains in Morocco. He had this huge grow house. Like, he had literally tons of weed bagged up all up to the ceiling. Um, just everything. It was crazy. So then we did that. And and then he took me to, like, his little kind of had this weird, I don't know what you would call it. It's like a, a luxury cabin, I guess, where he would, like, he showed me all the backside, the back end of it, where he's, you know, he's doing all the orders on the internet. He's bagging them up. He's sending them off. Like, it was incredible, really. Like, and he was making, I don't know, like 100 grand a week or something which for some drug dealers might not be a lot, but for him, it, it was a lot, you know. He only had a small team, so it was very interesting, man. Now, what would motivate him to want to do an interview with you? Well, for him, I guess, ego, yeah. <laughs> to be honest. Like, a lot of people are driven by ego, I think, um, which is fine to a degree, but some of them lose their minds with it, you know. Um, but, yeah, I guess, also, I guess for him, if he sees, in his head, he sees, like, oh, this this big article in Vice about his group, he might think, oh, we're going to get, you know, more sales now. I mean, I 
probably think the opposite. You know, if it was, I don't do drugs. I'm, I'm not into any of that. But if I did, I, I certainly, certainly wouldn't want to like buy them from a guy that's been advertised in bites. <laughs> you know, essentially. But uh, I don't know. That was his thought. Now, now how about him? Was he uh, a drug user? Well, yeah. I mean, the first day I met him, we were like, we went through the mountains. Actually, or like second day or something, we went through the mountains. And he's like, oh, do you want to, um, do you want to lie? And I was like, I don't do drugs, man. And he's like, oh, do you don't mind if I do? I was like, no, nah. I, like, I don't care. Like, I've been around loads of people doing drugs. And then he just like poured out like a line onto his phone and was like sniffing coke on the way up the mountain. It was just crazy. And then one time he was like taking Oxycontin. And I was like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> like, this guy is a, he's a very heavy operator, you know? Very, I mean, he didn't seem like a drug addict or anything, but certainly he liked to have a good time, I guess. And that was a line of heroin or coke? Uh, coke, coke, yeah, Okay, yeah, that's yeah. interesting. Now, mm-hmm. uh, how about this one here? In search of illegal arms traffickers in Afghanistan. Now, how did you make contact with them? <laughs> <laughs> how are you finding these people with? Man, <laughs> I'm a weird guy, man. Yeah. <laughs> just, the, the thing, the darkest sides of the world, like, interest me so much. But, yeah, yeah. that was um, Franz J. Marty wrote the article for, uh, for Popular Front. Um, and, yeah, that was amazing, man. Like, he spent a lot of time in Afghanistan and you know he's he's like a, a white guy from um i think from i don't know belgium or somewhere like that and i think they he just ended up spending so much time in the the, the kind of most brutal rural areas um the people just kind of gained the respect for him and were like okay you know like he's he's about it we'll take him there and we'll show him this and whatever so in afghanistan things are different as well like things change so rapidly there that the threat of detection or getting caught is it doesn't even matter like you know they don't really care Really? It's, they're the areas they operate in. It's like the police haven't been there for about 10 years. You know what I mean? Gotcha, so, gotcha. Now, we only got about four minutes left. <clears throat> uh-huh. Now, I know that uh, you, the other day you were saying you were looking for correspondents, for r- reporters, for yeah. writers. Uh, describe the kind of people you're looking for to work with you on your projects here. Well, it's tricky, man. This is a good question. I mean, I want younger people as well because I think that, like, young people need their foot in the media. But then I also want people that are like from diverse backgrounds. And I don't just mean ethnically, that's not like a woke thing. I think that like any kind of a different background really helps with journalism, you know, like I don't, none of my family are journalists, you know, none of my family are rich or anything like that, you know, grew up very, very um, humbly, you know, we didn't have any money. And it's like, I think that gives you a different uh, kind of an edge in certain situations. And I want people from other backgrounds that have an edge from some other type of upbringing that I think will bring something good to popular front, you know? And also, like, people that are not too ideological, you know? Like, I don't want I don't want to hire someone that's going to be like, I'm not going there because, you know, like, I don't know, whatever their political ideology is, it doesn't agree with them or whatever. Like, I think, you know, if you're a journalist, you cannot be an activist at the same time, I don't think. It's, hmm. it's tricky, you know? Especially if you're on the ground in a war zone, you can get yourself into trouble. So, yeah, I guess those are the kind of people we're looking for. Just different people young and people that want to work extremely hard you know like i i have no time for people that are lazy you know now would you would fund their travels or would they have to be self-supporting yeah i would fund it. i would fund it like that's the idea like in the future i hope next year I'm, I'm going to try and raise a little bit more money we've got some plans to do that and i want to just be able to say to someone like hey uh, you know we're going to send you away with one of our guys or women or whatever like one of our producers and cameramen camera women and you go and make it we'll pay you we will not pay you a lot we won't pay you the same way that like you know the tv will pay you because you don't have that money but we will pay you and you know and you will get you know it's, it's a good good way for us to grow and i think it's good for we have respect in the in the kind of journalism community now and i think that it will be good for for the reporters as well well we got a lot of great young men and women who listen to this show that that i think fit that description so hopefully uh, we can send some people your way Jake, yeah, man, definitely. Yeah, jakehanrahan.com, popularfront.co. The Patreon is called Popular Front. And then as well, the, the YouTube channel. And and how about your Twitter? What's your Twitter called? Jake Hanrahan, right? Uh, yeah, Jake underscore Hanrahan. H A N R A H A N. That's any social media, that's my handle. Um, yeah. Jake, thank you so much. Uh, anytime you got something you want to promote, give me a call. We'll put you right on here, okay? Absolutely. Thank you, mate. Really appreciate it. I really enjoyed this. Thank you, mate. Good night. Speak soon. Bye-bye. And now a word from our sponsors. OppermanReport.com Hey, do you like what you're hearing? 
Do you like the work that you see us doing here at Opperman Report? You can support that work by becoming a member at OppermanReport.com. And as you have access to over 200 exclusive shows and interviews that you can't find on YouTube or Spreaker or iHeart or iTunes or KYAH, you can't find them anywhere else online, exclusive to our member sections, to our members. Also, too, there's images, videos, documents, court docs. And don't forget, you can hear your ad played here on the Opera and Report, reach hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people on a daily basis because the show is repeated every day all over the world. Contact me at operandreport at gmail.com and I'll give you a good deal on on advertising rates. Have you ever thought about opening your own mobile cart or kiosk business? Maybe the facility you manage could establish new revenue by adding coffee, food, or retail services. Cart King International can be the answer to your needs. Cart King is a North American designer and manufacturer of the finest mobile coffee, food, and retail carts and kiosks. Cart King has been working with clients and corporations across North America for 20 years, providing innovative designs, custom manufacturing, and timely delivery. Carts and kiosks are fun, and so are the dozens of designs on our website. Please visit us today at www.cart-king.com or just call us at one 877 986-7771 986-7771 and get your sales rolling. The Opperman Report is brought to you by Aquadam.net. You can give them a call at 707-764-2119. A flooded home is never easy to deal with. You're left with the mess to clean up, the insurance companies to deal with, and not to mention all the memories, the precious memories that are lost in the flood. You can never replace those. And Aquadam can be a tool in your arsenal to protect your home and property from the floodwaters. The coffer dam is filled with water to control water and is reusable as long as it's taken care of. It can protect your home or business from rising floodwaters like a dam, but without the beavers. It can also be used in construction. If you need an area to be dewatered, an aqua dam can do the job. An aqua dam was used at SeaWorld in Orlando for the Mako roller coaster ride during the coaster's construction by dewatering the work area. An aqua dam is now dewatering the work area at San Antonio SeaWorld for their newest roller coaster ride. An aqua dam has been used in many construction projects all around the U.S. and all around the world. Now give aqua dam a call, 707-764-2119. You can look them up online at aquadam.net. You can find them on Facebook at Aquadam Inc. You call them up, you email them, you tell them Ed Opperman sent you, and they're going to take 10% off the price. Aquadam.net, 707-764-2119. Are you ready to change your life but don't know how to start? Is your stress and worries keeping you awake at night? Have you been battling grief, anxiety, or depression all alone? Have you lost touch with your own sense of being or spirituality? Soul Free Therapies offers professional and affordable live video streaming counseling and coaching services from the comfort of your own home. Sessions offered in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. Go to our website at www.soul-free.com and book your first session today. If you find yourself in need of legal representation, it can be a very stressful time in your life. In my career, I have dealt with thousands of lawyers, I've dealt with thousands of law firms, and I can confidently recommend to you Keith M. Davidson at kmdlaw.com. Available 24 hours, seven days a week, just log into kmdlaw.com, that's kmdlaw.com, or you can call toll-free 833-4-KMD-LAW, that's 833-4-KMD-LAW personal injury, wrongful death, STDs, sexual assault, car accidents. They handle it all efficiently and professionally. It doesn't matter how imposing the opposition may be because the team at kmdlaw.com are battle-tested and fierce. They will not stop until justice prevails. Go to kmdlaw.com or call toll-free 833-4KMD-LAW. If you're in for the fight of your life, stop screwing around and contact kmdlaw. puresoapflakes.com 218-568-2525. Have you ever heard of Castile Soap? Pure Soap Flake Company handcrafts fine soap bars, laundry powder, and concentrated soap flakes using organic vegetable oils from their northern Minnesota facility. Bathe your body and wash your clothes with pure soap products that are free of fragrance, GMOs, palm oil, sodium lauryl sulfate, and synthetic additives. Keep it clean, folks. Pure Soap Flake Company products are kind to living creatures and sensitive skin, safe for drains and waterways, and work great in high-efficiency washers and top- and front-loading machines. 
They have a little promotion going on. Contact them to order some soap. Mention the Opperman Report. You're going to get a free gift. They're going to send a little extra soap, travel size, soap bars and laundry soap, cleaning soap flakes. I've been using that stuff all day long today. Great stuff. Order today at puresoapflakes.com or give them a call. 218-568-2525. 218-568-2525. Pure Soap Flake Company is a proud member of the Handcrafted Soap and Cosmetic Guild. 